If you want to support The Missing Witches Project, you can do so by buying our book, reviewing it on Amazon and Goodreads, using offer code MISSINGWITCHES when you shop at Foxglove Farm, become a Patreon patron, or pick up some Missing Witches merch at Tee Public. You aren't being a proper woman, therefore you must be a witch. You must be a witch. Moon marked and touched by sun. Her magic is unwritten, but when the sea turns back, it will leave her shape behind. When self-described black, lesbian, mother, warrior, poet, Audre Lorde wrote those words in the first person in A Woman Speaks, she was only partly correct. Some, though definitely not all, of her magic is most assuredly written. Audrey has been on my Missing Witches to-do list pretty much from the jump. My first Twitter account still shows one of her quotes as my pinned tweet. I put a clip of her reading A Woman Speaks in an episode of our first season. But I kept putting Audrey's story on the back burner. I'll be honest, writing about Audrey scares me. Smarter people than me have written theses and diatribes on her work. The ultimate sister outsider who led a complex life from inside an even more complex identity. The ultimate sister outsider whose primary message was that we can look, act, think, be different, and still unified. The ultimate sister outsider who shouts in my ear that I am not free while any woman is unfree, even though her shackles are different than my own. How can I express here the debt of gratitude I owe to the person who taught me the lesson from that pinned tweet? If I didn't define myself for myself, I would be crunched into other people's fantasies for me and eaten alive. I do not want to fuck this up. For me, for this coven, for Audrey. My hope is to inspire our coven members who don't know Audrey Lord to seek her out, read all her books, and fall in love. Pro tip, start with her collection of essays, Sister Outsider, Be Forever Changed, and Better Prepared to Change the World. The essays included bear such titles as Poetry is Not a Luxury, Uses of the Erotic, the Erotic is Power, Uses of Anger, and The Master's Tools Will Never Dismantle the Master's House. Those of you who already adore and admire Audrey as much as I do, or know her better than I do, I'm still working through her catalogue, I hope you'll let me know how I can be of better service to her name. If I fuck it up. So, why now? Why choose the spring of 2021 to break my self-imposed silence? Well, it's because 2020 was fucking crazy, Natch. But amidst the chaos, a new awareness, maybe even a new hope, was brewing. A radical future that we were envisioning together where access to healthcare matters, where social and economic justice matter, where black lives fucking matter. Now, a year later, we are left with what feels sometimes like only paint flaking off once proudly muraled streets. The cancellation of Aunt Jemima, a white supremacist population that was so freaked out by the riots that they doubled down on their own racism, despite the offending movement having already been co-opted by white people who were not listening. And it got me to thinking about Audrey and her words. I was brought or made very, very conscious of the ways in which black women and white women do not hear each other. Angie Franklin, the founder of Afro Yoga, in her essay, Ghosted by Allies, Why Bi POC Still Can't Trust White People with Social Justice, wrote, We all knew it was coming. I'd venture to say every single black person in America not only knew it was coming, but was actively waiting for it to happen. After the black square badge of anti-racism, the allyship die-off was not surprising, nor was it a new experience for us. What was new was Black Lives Matter and social justice going viral. All of a sudden, people gave a fuck about us, or acted like they did. Because it was trending, and the perception of white people teetered on whether they showed public support for black lives. Businesses scrambled to photograph black models to diversify their feeds and commercials. White people moved out of the way on the street to let us pass and express their condolences. During this tumultuous time for black folks in America, it was as if we were supposed to relish in the fact that the whole world was expressing love for us. But the truth was, we knew it wouldn't last. And it didn't. So that's why we've gathered today to raise the voice of Audre Lorde. 
a black, lesbian, warrior, poet who never stopped speaking out, though she often felt that speaking to white women about racism was, quote, wasted energy because of destructive guilt and defensiveness. As the New York Times pull quote on the back of Sister Outsider, at least the edition I have, states, Lord's work will be important to those truly interested in growing up sensitive, intelligent, and aware. If I had to choose a singular, necessary voice for these times for this coven, it would be Audrey's, as she guides us to unlearn and work against our own destructive guilt and defensiveness. And in this, we must not give up. Protests do make change, although it feels agonizingly slow. One study measured a post-Ferguson possible coronation between BLM and police homicide numbers. It found that municipalities where BLM protests have been held experienced as much as a 20% decrease in killings by police. The occurrence of local protests increased the likelihood of police departments adopting body-worn cameras and community policing initiatives. Remember, protest comes in many forms, but obviously there is still much witch work to be done. Audrey said a poetry reading is a ritual of shared emotional experience. There is a touching, a strengthening of what I'm trying to do with my poetry and a connection between people, which I believe is what poetry is all about. I hope this is also true of podcasts. Earlier, I said that smarter people than me have written about Audrey, and I want to point to one of those smarter than me's now, the incomparable Angela Davis, who, in a speech about Audrey at Medgar Evers College, boiled much of Audrey's philosophy down to a single, chantable catchphrase of a message. Unity does not require that we be identical. Recalling a conversation with Audrey, Angela quotes her, we sometimes find it difficult to deal constructively with the genuine differences between us and to recognize that unity does not require that we be identical to each other. Audrey spoke of the influence of homophobia in conversations about race and the influence of race on conversations about sex and gender. Angela says Audrey, quote, worked hard to pull apart the assumption that sameness was a prerequisite for unity. We continue to rely on her insights whenever we attempt to imagine and organize radical movements that bring together people across racial, gender, sexual, national borders. Audrey's work speaks to the ideas of both community and individualism. She insists that we speak our truths, but also, as importantly, that we shut up and listen to the truths of others. Angela Davis said, Western cultures have had a hard time allowing difference to do its work. In order to be acceptable, it has to be capable of integration, incorporation, homogenization. This logic has helped to bolster not only homophobia, but racisms of many sorts. Anti-Indigenous, anti-Black, anti-Latino, anti-Asian, anti-Muslim. In Age, Race, Sex, and Class, Audrey wrote, Too often we pour the energy needed for recognizing and exploring difference into pretending those differences are insurmountable barriers, or that they do not exist at all. This results in voluntary isolation, or false and treacherous connections. Either way, we do not develop tools for using difference as a springboard for creative change within our lives. We speak not of human difference but of human deviance. For Audrey, difference is not a barrier, but a creative resource with limitless potential that requires both our voices and our ears, our minds and souls in equal measure. Because again, Audrey didn't believe in the imposed binary of life. She saw no distinction between her poetry and her academic critical theory. Nancy K. Barano wrote in her Introduction to Sister Outsider, We have been told that poetry expresses what we feel and theory states what we know. The white Western patriarchal ordering of things requires that we believe that there is an inherent conflict between what we feel and what we think, between poetry and theory. We are easier to control when one part of ourselves is split from another, fragmented, off balance. There are other configurations, however, other ways of experiencing the world, though they are often difficult to name. We can sense them and seek their articulation, because it is the work of feminism, and I'll add here witchcraft, to make connections, 
to heal unnecessary divisions. Sister Outsider is a reason for hope. Audre Lorde's writing is an impulse toward wholeness. If I didn't define myself for myself, I would be crunched into other people's fantasies for me and eaten alive. You know, we don't have control over a lot in this world. We are prisoners of our place and time, the skin we're in, bodies and families we did not choose, but there are things we get to choose. Our priorities beyond basic needs, how we conduct ourselves, the lens through which we observe the world, and how we act upon those observations. One of these choices is a more common struggle than most of us would like to believe. Whether tis nobler to define ourselves for ourselves, or be eaten alive to feed the expectations of others. This is a decision that creeps into every moment of every day, whether we acknowledge it or not. How you present, how you behave, how you talk or don't talk. How you choose a lover or a job. Will you live who you are and be an outsider or pretend to be what someone else wants you to be, slowly eaten away by the corrosive gastric acids inside the belly of society's beast? I was born working class and white in a white working class town. There was nothing about me that really stood out on a surface level, but like Audrey, I had a family and classmates that didn't understand me. I was weird. I am weird. <laughs> Anxious, but creative. I learned very early that I had two options. Stand out and take the heat. Teasing. Insults. Threats. Popcorn landing in my hair from across the hall. Or I could blend in. Fade away. The real me. The weird, transgressive me. Eaten alive and disappeared. The privilege is that I had a choice. Most people cannot change or hide what makes them the other. I entered the world in a white suit of armor with a female chink. Us others, and I do still choke on this word, other. Surely women, femmes, POCs, queers, witches, the differently abled, and atypically the generally not normal constitute the majority in this world. But us, we grew up knowing that we had to be twice as good to get half as far. Audrey describes what she calls a, quote, mythical norm, which each of us within our hearts knows that's not me. In America, this norm is usually defined as white, thin, male, young, heterosexual, Christian, and financially secure. It is with this mythical norm that the trappings of power reside within society. Those of us who stand outside that power often identify one way in which we are different, and we assume that to be the primary cause of all oppression, forgetting other distortions around difference, some of which we ourselves may be practicing. By and large, within the women's movement today, white women focus upon their oppression as women and ignore the differences of race, sexual preference, class, and age. There is a pretense to a homogeneity of experience covered by the word sisterhood that does not, in fact, exist. Kathleen Newman Brengang wrote, Black History Month has almost always been about paying tribute to the history of black people in this country, a history that is full of pain or stories of extraordinary human beings whose contributions to the fabric of this nation are overlooked and ignored, black trauma or excellence, no in-between. I hope all this listening and learning and feigned wokeness of last summer starts to pay off in tangible ways. This is the time for allies to prove they've actually been listening. It's their time to pick up the burden. I hope this month is different not just because non-black people are promising to do better, but because they are actually following through. There are many aspects to authenticity, dear Coven, and one is to practice what we preach. Back up our hashtags with real listening real learning, and real action. Brene Brown said, if you trade your authenticity for safety, you may experience the following. Anxiety, depression, eating disorders, addiction, rage, blame, resentment, and inexplicable grief. So maybe in addition to our various definitions of authenticity, there are two different definitions of safety here. There's the safety of security, a normal family, normal friends, a normal job, a retirement fund, suburban home, a self that fits into the norm, an unrocked boat. 
I think this is the kind of safety Brene means here with her eat-pray-love journey of discovery and self-actualization. But there's another kind of safety that lives on the flip side of authenticity. Actual, physical, psychological, life-threatening danger. So before we carry on with this Audre Lorde-inspired sermon on being yourself, let me just acknowledge that there are places where you can be killed legally or illegally, or driven to suicidal thoughts for being yourself. If that self is witchy, queer, slutty, loud, trans, or even just different. If this applies to you, know that you owe your true self only to yourself. It's okay to keep your secret safe until you can get to a place where you and your secret are safe. You can look for that place, whether it's a different country or a different coven. We know that growth lives outside of our comfort zones in taking chances and being vulnerable, but once again, safe from being killed? Important. Safe from people kind of looking at you funny on the street? Mm. Not as important. As Audrey wrote in her poem, Coal, there are many kinds of open. How a diamond comes into a knot of flame. How a sound comes into a word colored by who pays what for speaking. Audrey reminds us that the price for speaking out is much higher for some than for others. For some, speaking out could mean death. So, because in this non-binary universe there are no either-ors, only ands, and because visibility matters, sometimes we have to make sacrifices to make things easier for the next generation, protecting them from future harm. We must paradoxically strive to be safe and brave. Audrey reminds us in her essay, The Transformation of Silence into Language and Action, I have come to believe over and over again that what is most important to me must be spoken, made verbal, and shared, even at the risk of having it bruised or misunderstood. Audrey's book Zami is what she calls a mythobiography, chronicling her early life, and I honestly should have just named this episode Go Read Everything You Can by Audrey Lord, but here's a taste. Delois lived up the block on 142nd Street and never had her hair done, and all the neighbor women sucked their teeth as she walked by. Her crispy hair twinkled in the summer sun as her big, proud stomach moved her on down the block while I watched, not caring whether or not she was a poem. Even though I tied my shoes and tried to peep under her blouse as she passed by, I never spoke to Delois, because my mother didn't. But I loved her because she moved like she felt she was somebody special. Like somebody I'd like to know someday. She moved like how I thought God's mother must have moved, and my mother, once upon a time, and someday, maybe me. Who is your Delois? Do you remember? In your childhood, seeing someone who, by behaving as if they were someone special, inspired you to express your true self? I have a few. Documentary clips of Haight-Ashbury in 1967, Grace Jones and Philip Tracy, John Waters' Hairspray. But the most visceral, Delois-style memory I have is seeing the club kids on Geraldo. I was 12 years old, and even though they were set up as punchlines for audience mockery and disdain, no one knew then that Michael Alec would murder Angel Melendez six years later. The party monster himself died last year, so... Needless to say, the idolatry began and ended in the early 90s, but the spark, oof, the spark only grew. So, even though they were set up as punchlines for audience mockery and disdain, all I saw was art and freedom embodied, superficial as it may have been. I want this podcast to be a Delois. <laughs> I want you to hear about these witches and walk taller, prouder though they may suck their teeth as you pass, knowing that you are somebody special, an insider to a rich and powerful lineage. Witches, we're back to talk about Foxglove Farm. We love these subscription boxes, subscription boxes, subscription boxes, <laughs> and how full of magic they are. Yeah, recently you spoke once or twice or a million times about um, us being so lucky, having found like soulmate collaborators in each other, soulmate editors, and 
I think I would like to add Fox Glove Farm to that list of soulmates, uh, a soulmate yeah. sponsor, who really is just like, it's hard to be anti-capitalist and still like eat food, as we all know. Yeah. So it was really important for us to find a sponsor that was like ethically sound, or at least like in line with our values. And Sammy is like that and beyond. Yeah, plus the boxes are so cute and they support so many witches and so many artists. It's just like a, a wonderful little bit of self-care that is community care that you can do to go get yourself one of these subscription boxes and you're sponsoring and supporting Missing Witches when you do it. So get, get yourself a month. It. Yeah, get yourself a monthly present and don't forget to use that offer code Missing Witches when you shop at boxglovefarm.com. In Zami, Audrey wrote this passage a roller coaster of delight and sorrow. In high school, my best friends were the branded, as our sisterhood of rebels sometimes called ourselves. But sometimes I was close to crazy with believing that there was some secret thing wrong with me personally that formed an invisible barrier between me and the rest of my friends, who were white. What was it that kept people from inviting me to their houses, their parties, their summer homes for a weekend? Was it their mothers did not like them to have friends the way my mother didn't? Did their mothers caution them about never trusting outsiders? But they visited each other. There was something here that I was missing. Obviously, the trouble was me. I had no word for racism. We were the branded, the lunatic fringe, proud of our outrageousness and our madness, our bizarre colored inks and quill pens. We learned how to mock the straight set and how to cultivate our group paranoia into an instinct for self-protection that always stopped our shenanigans just short of expulsion. We wrote obscure poetry and cherished our strangeness as the spoils of default. And in the process, we learned that pain and rejection hurt, but that they weren't fatal, and that they could be useful since they couldn't be avoided. We learned that not feeling at all was worse than hurting. At that time, suffering was clearly what we did best. We became the branded because we learned how to make a virtue of it. It was in high school that I came to believe that I was different from my white classmates, not because I was black, but because I was me. In her 1980 essay, Age, Race, Sex, and Class, Audrey describes, As a 49-year-old black lesbian feminist socialist mother of two, including one boy and a member of an interracial couple, I usually find myself part of some group defined as other, deviant, inferior, or just plain wrong. But this was Audrey from the jump. Born in the New York City of 1934, she was the youngest of three sisters. Her two older sisters formed a pair of placid perfection, while Audrey was, according to her biographer Alexis DeVoe, recalcitrant. In this biography, Warrior Woman, Alexis wrote, her memories of childhood became almost mythic constructions of an ugly duckling who was legally blind before age five, clumsy, inarticulate, born left-handed, a stutterer who got whipped repeatedly, fat, and black. By her own accounts, she was lonely, unwanted, and unloved. Audrey's sisters, Phyllis and Helen, in addition to being closer in humor, were also closer in age, so they became a duo, leaving Audrey to find her way as a third wheel without an axle. Helen and Phyllis were obedient Catholic girls, wrote Alexis. They learned their catechisms inside out, never questioned the nuns, and did what they were told. Audrey was, on the other hand, recalcitrant, refusing to fit into the mold. Audrey argued and reasoned and questioned. Her grades for conduct were consistently lower than her grades for academics. She wrote her first poem at 13 and had one published at 15 in Seventeen magazine. Before her death at age 58, she lived in Germany and Grenada, worked as a librarian, professor, poet, world-class, world-changing public speaker, activist, and created a legacy that I hope will inform our collective future. There's a video on YouTube that I'll put in the show notes where Audrey reads her poem, A Woman Speaks, the poem for which this episode is titled. Moon marked and touched by sun, my magic is unwritten, but when the sea turns back, they will leave my shape behind. Later, 
I have been woman for a long time. Beware my smile. I am treacherous with old magic. But before she goes into her reading, Audrey makes the statement I mentioned before, saying, I've just returned from a feminist conference and a book fair in London where, for a week, over and over again, I was brought or made very, very conscious of the ways in which black women and white women do not hear each other. So, yet again, this is an attempt. Audrey made many attempts over her life and career to be heard, to make it clear that her voice needed to be heard. In an interview, she said, words had an energy and a power, and I came to respect that power early. Has anyone ever told you, when you were angry or frustrated, to use your words? That's Audrey. She used her words to channel frustration, open doors, and dialogues that a lot of us are too scared to even approach. One night she was driving and heard on the news that a ten-year-old boy had been shot by police. She pulled over and wrote her poem, Power. I am lost without imagery or magic, trying to make power out of hatred and destruction. Her An Open Letter to Mary Daly is a crash course masterclass in calling in before you call out, and I'm going to read a bunch of it here because we are by necessity more enlightened people for having read it. But please go read the whole letter. I'll put a link in the show notes. It was extremely difficult to cut this letter's pages down for time. How do you edit something that's already perfect? I tried. In a preamble to the publication of this letter, Audrey wrote, The following letter was written to Mary Daly, author of Gyne Ecology, on May 6, 1979. Four months later, having received no reply, I open it to the community of women. So here's some quick background before we get into the letter. In 1978's Gyne Ecology, Daly claimed that male culture was the direct evil opposite of female nature, and that the ultimate purpose of men was death of both women and nature. Daly contrasted women's life-giving powers with men's death-dealing powers. Now, I haven't read gynecology, and I'm not nearly as into gender essentialism as some of the radical feminists I've read about with their all-female utopias. But damn, there's something to that. Let's replace the reductive men with white supremacist capitalist patriarchy and read it again. The ultimate purpose of white supremacist capitalist patriarchy is death of both women and nature. That feels real. Audrey had some issues with the book and so wrote the following letter. Here's most of it. Dear Mary, when I started reading Gyne Ecology, I was truly excited by the vision behind your words and nodded my head as you spoke in your first passage of myth and mystification. Your words on the nature and function of the goddess, as well as the ways in which her face has been obscured, agreed with what I myself have discovered in my searches through African myth, legend, religion, for the true nature of old female power. So I wondered, why doesn't Mary deal with Afriquete as an example? Why are her goddess images only white, Western, European, Judeo-Christian? Where was Afriquete? Yemaya, Oyo and Mualisa. Where were the warrior goddesses of Vodan, the Dahomean Amazons, and the warrior women of Dan? Well, I thought, Mary has made a conscious decision to narrow her scope and deal only with the ecology of Western European women. Then I came to the first three chapters of your second passage, and it was obvious that you were dealing with non-European women, but only as victims and prayers upon each other. I began to feel my history and my mythic background distorted by the absence of any images of my foremothers in power. Your inclusion of African genital mutilation was an important and necessary piece in any consideration of female ecology, and too little has been written about it. To imply, however, that all women suffer the same oppression simply because we are women is to lose sight of the many varied tools of patriarchy. It is to ignore how those tools are used by women without awareness against each other. To dismiss our black foremothers may well be to dismiss where European women learned to love. As an African-American woman in white patriarchy, I am used to having my archetypal experience distorted and trivialized. But it is terribly painful to feel it being done by a woman whose knowledge so much touches my own. 
When I speak of knowledge, as you know, I am speaking of that dark and true depth which understanding serves, waits upon, and makes accessible through language to ourselves and others. It is this depth within each of us that nurtures vision. What you excluded from gynecology dismissed my heritage and the heritage of all other non-European women and denied the real connections that exist between all of us. It is obvious that you have done a tremendous amount of work for this book, but simply because so little material on non-white female power and symbol exists in white women's words from a radical feminist perspective, to exclude this aspect of connection from even comment in your work is to deny the fountain of non-European female strength and power that nurtures each of our visions. It is to make a point by choice. Then to realize that the only quotations from black women's words were the ones you used to introduce your chapter on African genital mutilation made me question why you needed to use them at all. For my part, I felt that you had in fact misused my words, utilized them only to testify against myself as a woman of color. So the question arises in my mind, Mary, do you ever really read the work of black women? Did you ever read my words, or did you merely finger through them for quotations which you thought might valuably support an already conceived idea concerning some old and distorted connection between us? This is not a rhetorical question. Have you read my work and the work of other black women for what it could give you? Or did you hunt through only to find words that would legitimize your chapter on African genital mutilation in the eyes of other black women? And if so, then why not use our words to legitimize or illustrate the other places where we connect in our being and becoming? If, on the other hand, it was not black women you were attempting to reach, in what way did our words illustrate your point for white women? Mary, I ask that you be aware of how this serves the destructive forces of racism and separation between women. The assumption that the herstory and myth of white women is the legitimate and sole herstory and myth of all women is to call upon for power and background, and that non-white women in our herstories are noteworthy only as decorations or examples of female victimization. I ask that you be aware of the effect that this dismissal has upon the community of black women and other women of color and how it devalues your own words. This dismissal does not essentially differ from the specialized devaluations that make black women prey, for instance, to the murders even now happening in your own city. When patriarchy dismisses us, it encourages our murders. When radical lesbian feminist theory dismisses us, it encourages its own demise. This dismissal stands as a real roadblock to communication between us. This block makes it far easier to turn away from you completely than to attempt to understand the thinking behind your choices. Should the next step be war between us, or separation? Assimilation within a solely Western European history is not acceptable. Mary, I ask that you remember what is dark and ancient and divine within yourself that aids your speaking. As outsiders, we need each other for support and connection and all the other nece necessities of living on the borders. But in order to come together, we must recognize each other. Surely you know that for non-white women in this country, there is an 80% fatality rate from breast cancer, three times the number of unnecessary eventrations, hysterectomies, and sterilizations as for white women, three times as many chances of being raped murdered, or assaulted as exist for white women. These are statistical facts, not coincidences, nor paranoid fantasies. Within the community of women, racism is a reality, force, in my life, as it is not in yours. The white women with hoods on in Ohio handing out KKK literature on the street may not like what you have to say, but they will shoot me on sight. If you and I were to walk into a classroom of women in dismal Gulch, Alabama, where the only thing they know about each of us is that we were both lesbian, radical, feminist, you would see exactly what I mean. The oppression of women knows no ethnic nor racial boundaries, true, but that does not mean it is identical within those differences, nor do the reservoirs of our ancient power know these boundaries. To deal with one without even alluding to the other, is to distort our commonality as well as our difference. 
for then beyond sisterhood is still racism. We first met at the MLA panel, the Transformation of Silence into Language and Action. This letter attempts to break a silence which I had imposed upon myself shortly before that date. I had decided never again to speak to white women about racism. I felt it was wasted energy because of the destructive guilt and defensiveness, and because whatever I had to say might be better said by white women to one another, at far less emotional cost to the speaker, and probably with better hearing. But I would like not to destroy you in my consciousness, nor to have to. So as a sister hag, I ask you to speak to my perceptions. Whether or not you do, Mary, again, I thank you for what I have learned from you. This letter is in repayment. In the hands of Africate, Audrey Lord. Oh, Audrey. <laughs> like, I learned something from you, now I'm going to repay you by teaching you something is an excellent approach to disagreement, criticism, and communal understanding. It turns out that Mary did write back. Her response was found among Audrey's papers after she died. I won't read you the response because it felt to me like a lot of excuses, the caliber of which includes but is not limited to, I didn't have your address. But I will note one thing. Audrey's letter was dated May 6, 1979. Mary Daly's response was dated September 22, 1979, four and a half months later. You'll recall that Audrey said she had waited four months for a response, so I can't help but wonder if Mary got wind of Audrey taking the letter public and only then wrote back, you know, for the optics. We know that Audrey is a role model, a vocal advocate of the power of difference and unity, but does that make her a witch? Uh, maybe. <laughs> But this is the Missing Witches podcast, so let's focus for a minute on the spiritual path of our sister outsider. Her poems speak of a soul, black and proud, seeking and finding the gods of her ancestors while lamenting a history that tried to erase them. Her poems, The Winds of Arisha and From the House of Yumaya, ring out with lines like, I will become myself an incantation. And, I am the sun and moon, and forever hungry. For me, since the Missing Witches book, available now, is structured around the Wheel of the Year, Audrey's poems Solstice and Equinox are of particular interest. Audrey describes her poem Solstice as a call to power. Our skins are empty. They have been vacated by spirits who are angered by our reluctance to feed them. Equinox. Today, both children came home from school talking about spring and peace. And I wonder if they will ever know it. I want to tell them we have no right to spring because our sisters and brothers are burning, because every year the oil grows thicker, and even the earth is crying, because black is beautiful but currently going out of style. That we must be very strong and love each other in order to go on living. Nature is real and tangible. The environment we live in, the topography of parks, windowsill gardens and forests, the movement of the earth and sun. But we witches also live inside the metaphor of nature, the solstice when we are decided, clear and full, the equinox when we are malleable and admire the transitional times. The spring equinox brings the promise of growth, but that growth depends on the seeds we plant. It is the same for farmers, as it is for activists and poets. We must be very strong and love each other in order to go on living. Audrey was diagnosed with breast cancer in 1978 and had a mastectomy. In her battle, she used her words, writing the cancer journals, and viewing her cancer as another difference on which she would not be silent or rendered invisible. Prosthesis offers the empty comfort of nobody will know the difference. But it is that very difference which I wish to affirm, because I have lived it, and survived it, and wish to share that strength with other women. If we are to translate the silence surrounding breast cancer into language and action against this scourge, then the first step is that women with mastectomies must become visible to each other. Of all the thousands 
literally thousands of memeable quotes I could have chosen for the title of this episode, I went with Moonmarked and Touched by Sun, because I feel like, in a way, it sums Audrey and us up. The moon and sun are individual celestial objects. The moon is an independent being, and yet what we perceive of it is largely dictated by the reflected light of the sun. We must look beyond what we are told to find the truth, knowing we are affected by both. Our existence relies equally on light and darkness, in all its beautiful difference. Where we are on the earth and in our lives dictates what and how we see. Audrey declared herself both the sun and moon. The sun and moon and we need not be identical to be unified in the dance of our reality. Here in the Missing Witch's Coven, I want us all to feel like we belong. Not because we are all the same, but because we appreciate and admire each other's differences. That here, if nowhere else, we are insiders. Each bringing our own strengths and vulnerabilities, our powers, our variant and atypical strands, forming a web overlaid in delicate protection of our unity. That as you listen to my voice, Risa's and our guests' voices, that you also feel heard. A sister among all we outsiders. Tending to each other's battle wounds and emotional scars. Wailing sympathetically like a less creepy midsummer harga cult and using that collective strength of difference and unity to carry on the fight. Be very strong and love each other in order to go on living. Today I'll leave you with this. In Age, Race, Sex, and Class, Audrey wrote, Change means growth, and growth can be painful. But we sharpen self-definition by exposing the self in work and struggle together with those whom we define as different from ourselves, although sharing the same goals. For black and white, old and young, lesbian and heterosexual women alike, this can mean new paths to our survival. We have chosen each other at the edge of each other's battles. The war is the same. If we lose, someday women's blood will congeal upon a dead planet. If we win, there is no telling. We seek beyond history for a new and more possible meeting. You must be a witch. If you want to support the Missing Witches Project, you can do so by buying our book, reviewing it on Amazon and Goodreads, using offer code Missing Witches when you shop at Foxglove Farm, become a Patreon patron, or pick up some Missing Witches merch at Tee Public.